Um, Julie, just let us know. I guess let me know when I can start speaking then. Well, that's just now. <laughs> Can you speak again, Curtis? It was, I was getting, I'm getting an echo now. Hello? Hello? Yeah, still echo. Oh, I'm echoing, really? I'm echoing, really? Oh, wow, right. Yeah, but they can hear us, so yay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I guess we're going to begin now. Thank you, everybody, for being so patient. Hey, Camille, just go. Um, you can just start. Oh, okay. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I am so honored to be here and be able to have this chance to interview Larry and hear more about everything that he had. Sorry, hearing the feedback is kind of distracting. Um, but to talk to Larry Rennie Thomas, because he is known as the Wilmington 1898. He's a historian who has studied so much about Wilmington. And I'm just, I, I mean, the film is just so amazing. I can't wait to hear what he has to say and what more he wants to add from his experience working on Wilmington on Fire and what we can expect from the sequel coming out soon. So, Larry, thank you so much again for taking this time today. Thank you. Yeah, it's an echo for them, too. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, Larry, can you share a little bit about what, how you got involved with Wilmington 1898 and what your, your connection to Wilmington is? I'm a native of Wilmington. Uh, I uh, grew up there and growing up in Wilmington, I always knew there was something wrong with the place. There was kind of strange vibe in the air, but it wasn't until I got to grad school that I found out about uh, the massacre that took place in 1898. But I was in grad school in the late 70s, and I decided to do my thesis, Wilmington 10. If your audience is familiar with the Wilmington 10, but they were political prisoners during the 70s. It was a big deal, an international call celeb during the 70s. And I knew most of those people who were involved in that whole incident, the Wilmington 10 incident. So I decided I wanted to do my thesis on the Wilmington 10, but when I went to my advisor, and I asked him, could I do it on the Wilmington 10? This was in 1978, 79. And he said, well, it's not history yet. Mm. He said, I'd have to wait about 25 years before it would be history. So I decided, so I asked him, I said, well, why don't I do it on 1898? Because I'm from Wilmington and uh, I'd like to do it on 1898. And he said that um, that subject has been exhausted. Uh -huh. This was in 1970. And he was right, uh, because Charles Chestnut published a book in 1901 called The Marriage Tradition, and it's based on the uh, massacre of uh, yeah. Helen Edmonds wrote about it in the 1940s. Um, Harry Hayden wrote a book in 1931, I think, called The uh, Wilmington Rebellion of 1898. So that subject was exhausted, and according to him, according to him, it was exhausted because he was a, a historian, a Southern history history historian, he was an expert on Southern history. So I decided to write my thesis on what led up to the Wilmington Ten, and the academic title of my work is a study of racial violence in Wilmington, North Carolina, prior to February first, nineteen seventy one. And this is when the leader of the Wilmington 10, Ben Chavis, came to town. So in researching Wilmington's history, I found out that the town is almost synonymous with racial violence. There have been several events, racially charged events happening in Wilmington since mm -hmm. the beginning. I went all the way back to 1620 uh, and brought it up until 1971. And I did a lot of research and then I research, Chris Everett was able to find some of the research that I had done on 
will by a power grab. Basically, it was a, an economic, political, and social power grab. And it's, it was also um, a perfect example of economic envy, um, where the African-Americans at that particular time had advanced to such a status that the, the, um, the Europeans who were in control before the Civil War decided that they just couldn't tolerate it anymore. So they decided to overthrow the existing existing government, which at that particular time was a government that consisted of four Africans and five Caucasians. So mm. they just couldn't take the fact that they were being, quote unquote, governed or ruled by uh, what they call them, uh, they actually wrote up a, uh, what they call the White Constitution. And Declaration of the White Constitution, and they decided that they weren't going to be governed by a group of ignorant Africans. This is actually in what's called uh, the White Constitution, Declaration of White Constitution. But to answer, or give you a short answer was, it was told from the perspective of the Europeans who had taken over the city. And I was just reading some of it, because even when I was looking up questions to ask you, and when I Googled Wilmington 1898, I found those versions, and they kind of made it look as though the, we, um, the Black people had started it, the African Americans had started it, and so it was just in in response, but that wasn't the case. It was like, because can you kind of paint the picture of what life was like before 1898? Like 1897, you, it was even in the movie they mentioned it was a Mecca. Can you describe that a little bit more for those that may not have seen the film yet that need to go see the film immediately after this if they haven't? Well, you know, it, it was paradise, Camille. It really mm. was for Africans who were moving to that area because Wilmington is really um, uh, an ideal place to be. It has it's the paradise, really, because it has uh, nice temperatures. It never really gets too cold there, and it's surrounded by water. The ocean is on one side and the river is on the other side. So these Africans were moving there. And one of the things I like to point out is that it was a perfect example of African excellence because the people who were moving there were educated people. They had actually had four lawyers, four African-American lawyers. They had a doctor. And um, there was um, also the African-Americans African -American there had attained such an economic status that they had European butlers and European maids. Mm -hmm. And they were living on such a, I mean, it, was, um, it was an opportunity that 
uh, they they probably never thought would ever happen. You know, because it was attaining the status that which what you might resemble what resembles now was Atlanta, where African Americans had nice homes, they had good jobs, and the people who were in control before the Civil War, who were in control, they just couldn't take it. They just couldn't take the fact that these Africans had destroyed the whole concept of white supremacy. Mm-hmm. And I love also in the film, you mentioned that they were living, like there would be a black shop, a white shop, a black shop, and people were just inter- intermixing, interliving. Like it was, I mean, pretty much the American melting pot that we would kind of hope for now, <laughs> but it right. was happening then because there wasn't segregation. There wasn't any of that. Right. And I love that in the film that that was addressed. But so what was the big change that made everything that kind of boiled over to 1898? Can you speak a little bit also to um, the media's part into how they were able to, I mean, to win, I mean, to have this massacre happen? Well, Alexander Manley, the editor um, of the newspaper there, and you have to look at the fact that the, the, the African-American newspaper, which was owned by an African-American, but he had um, advertisers from both segments of the community, the European mm-hmm. community and the African community. He was doing quite well. Uh, and, I mean, you have to look at the, the what what they were doing, and the point I keep trying to stress is that they destroyed the whole premise of white supremacy. If, mm-hmm. Imagine if you were growing, if you grew up in Wilmington, you were a poor white or a middle class white or a white period, and you saw that these Africans had attained. I mean, it, it was it was remarkable what they did from 1865 to uh, 19 to the 1990s. They had, they had attained such um, a status, a political, economic, and social status that was remarkable. Mm-hmm. And and imagine imagine being a poor white seeing all these things that you've been taught your entire life, that these people were inferior, uh, that that they were apes, they actually call them apes, and these people were could attain such a status, that totally destroyed everything that you've been taught all your life, that, you know, these people were inferior to you. So they really couldn't take that. I mean, it, that, it really, beca- they became mad dogs. <laughs> and they really couldn't take it. And so, the, the people who were in control before the Civil War, and, and mind you, these were the, they came from the planner, the planners, okay. the European planners. They used the people who were the Scottish, Irish, the, the poor whites, the poor whites, and they whipped them up into a frenzy mm-hmm. and told them that if you get rid of these Africans, that we would promise you jobs. You know, so these two things were going on at the same time. They were promising them jobs, and they, were, they also destroyed the concept that the, they were better than these people. Right. So this is the crux of the whole matter. If you've been taught a certain lie your entire life, the same thing that went on with Obama, I hate to go up, come up to Martin era, but mm-hmm. the, Obama put a dent in this whole concept of white supremacy. That's why, that's why what's going on with this whole Trump thing, you know, mm-hmm. because the, the people who thought before a long time ago that Africans couldn't read or write or, 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 or attain an economic status that these Africans did in, in the 1890s, it just it, it set them off in a frenzy. So it was very easy to get these people to attack these people. And they actually put the intelligentsia on the trains and ran them out of town. So they didn't want, they didn't want any kind of evidence that the black man or the African was just as good or even better than they were. So it was a very, very nasty situation. And when I found out about it, I did my research on it and found out about it. What I was able to do was I started an organization and what I was able to do with my organization, my organization is called ICRO, the International Organization for Compensation and Reparations for the Victims of the Wilmington Massacre of 1898. My organization is an organization, a scholarly organization, and we 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 sought, found the descendants mm-hmm. of the people of the victims who were robbed. I found uh, Dr. Manley in Atlanta, and I found uh, Thomas C. Miller. Thomas C. Miller was phenomenal. He was a, a full-blooded African, 
Uh, he was not a mulatto, you know, and he was he was he was so smart that he was able to um, he became a loan shark. He loaned money to to uh, Europeans and Africans, so you know they wanted to get rid of him. And you know he um, he was a businessman. Mm -hmm. I found his descendants, Doctor Manley, and the descendants of Thomas C. Miller. They want to be compensated mm -hmm. for their loss. And this is what my organization is all about. We, we, we sought these people and found these people. And so I, I, I stress when we do our screenings and, uh, you know, and I do a book signing, I, you know, and I tell people that the only way people try to say, well, what can we do to solve this problem? The only thing you can do to solve this problem is compensate the people who were robbed, right. period. Right. You know, but people don't want to hear that because you start talking about uh, they, they have to admit, first of all, that, that a crime was done mm -hmm. and they don't want to do that. So when I when I bring it up, they try to change the subject to well, how can these people get along? Well, they, it's, it's not a matter of getting along. It's a matter of being, um, it, it's the right thing to do, regardless of what color these people were, you know, or what, quote unquote, I don't like to use that term race because that's a misnomer, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I don't like to use the term white or black. Black is a color, it's not a place. Right. White is a color, it's not a place. I call them Europeans. And I call Africans Africans. I hope I answered your question. No, <laughs> you did. Well, it. I also wanted to just because, like you were mentioning earlier about with Trump and Obama, I think it was so interesting when I was watching the film, how propaganda paid into it, how the media played into it, how they were able right. to demonize African-Americans and right. make it so easy for people that once were neighbors to now kind of turn against their neighbors that they had grown up with and were able so quickly to kind of change the whole um the whole Mecca into a uh, no man's land for black people. Nice and I just, yeah. And I just want to make sure people really pay attention to that part because right. if we're, that's the part of history that keeps repeating because it happened with Tulsa. It happened yes. at Rosewood. It happened. Yes. I mean, Nazi Germany, like it's the same thing where they demonize yes. a, a group of people. So it's so yes. easy to overtake them. And I just wanted mm -hmm. you to speak a little bit to that. And also like before this film, I had never heard of the red shirts. And so yes. can you also explain a little bit about their part in this, as well as the Secret Nine, um, how they were able to just, you know, people who once got along didn't, and how that affected Wilmington and how that changed everything that was going on that was so peaceful. And like you mentioned, it was paradise. Well, you know, you have to understand um, how well these people were living before this thing happened. Uh, like I said before, it's a paradise, and you know you can imagine people just sitting around watching these Africans work from sunup to sundown, and they're sitting on the porches sipping tea. They had, it was a wonderful life, but that whole life was disrupted when these Africans moved into Wilmington. There's a book, there's an excellent book called, um, uh, uh, written by a gentleman called. Uh, uh, um, it, it, it deals with the Reconstruction era. Okay. It's called Ballots and French Rail. Mm -hmm. And it describes how these African soldiers, these African soldiers uh, were marching into Wilmington. And they were, some of these soldiers eventually, because you have to understand what happened. The, 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 the treaty at Appomattox ending the war was signed, I think, in, in March. Okay. And Wilmington was not, uh, no, in April, excuse me. Wilmington was not defeated until all the, all the other ports of the Confederacy had been destroyed or been blocked. Uh, Charleston, of course, went first. Then Savannah, of course, when, when Sherman marched through Georgia, he, he marched to Savannah, he took over Savannah. And Norfolk was, was, was abandoned. The only port that was open was the one in Wilmington. And because they had they had what was called a blockade, and 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 the Confederate soldiers needed supplies, and supplies were coming through Wilmington. But mm -hmm. once the Union soldiers came into Wilmington and defeated um, Wilmington, and Wilmington fell, Wilmington was the last port to fall. 
this is very important, was the last port to fall. Because in, so in essence, my point has always been that they're still fighting the Civil War there because they never gave up. Because was, I think Wilmington was defeated. It was the last one. It was just, and so when, when these Union soldiers came in to Wilmington, some of them were Africans. And so I, there's a chapter in this book that I mentioned, uh, Ballots and French Rail, written by W. McGee Evans, where this old, old European is standing there while these soldiers are coming in. And, he's, and the name of the chapter is Blow Gabriel Blow. Okay. In other words, this man said, well, I'm dead. Because you see, these, he, he's observing these Africans coming into Wilmington, taking over Wilmington. He said, well, I'd rather be dead than to see this happen. So it was very, very easy for this planter class, very small, minute section of Wilmington, of that area. And the planters lived across the river. It was very easy for them to whip up a frenzy. Mm -hmm. And I call them their flunkies. Well, very easy for them to get their flunkies, whip them up, and say, well, these Negroes are trying to take over. Mm. Well, they weren't trying to take over. They were just trying to exist just like everybody else was existing. So these people, you, the people who were called the red shirts because they, they, they were bloody, were people who, came, who didn't come from the planter class. They didn't come from the rich folks. You have to understand the rich people were the ones who whipped these poor people and these working class Europeans into a frenzy okay. and got them to participate in this massacre. The Secret Nine were very, very well off Europeans, mm -hmm. basically English Europeans. You have to understand that, that the people who control this country and the people who control Wilmington, the Wilmington area at that time, come from what they call themselves white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. These are the people who control America. These are the, this is old money. Mm -hmm. You understand? These are the people who control America. And these are the people who control Wilmington. They were able to use the poor whites, use the working class whites, and pit them against these Africans. And they've, they've been working that all, all. They worked that in Tulsa. They worked that everywhere. I mean, you can't and help they, they're but notice it today. It now. Yep, they're I was working say, it today. Whether yes. it's the immigrants or it's Black Lives Matter, it's yes. showing the looting and all the negative sides, but not showing yes. what's really happening. So I just wanted to make sure we definitely covered that. But like looking for, um, I mean, people need to see the movie, and I don't want to tell too much that. Maybe they haven't seen in the movie, but I know that they probably had some of the same questions I had. As far as the massacre, how long did it last? Oh, it lasted a couple of days. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, it lasted a couple of days, maybe. Um, but what happened was, be, what they made sure that they got rid of, and this is very, very important, Camille. Mm -hmm. They made sure that they got rid of the intelligentsia, the thinking Negroes. Mm -hmm. They put them on a train. They rounded him up. They found Thomas C. Miller. Thomas C. Miller was walking down the street minding his business. And they grabbed him. And he said, well, what did I do? I said, I'm a tax-paying citizen. I didn't, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm a law-abiding citizen. They, all he had to do was look in the mirror to see what he had done. He was a prosperous businessman. Mm -hmm. He broke away, and they grabbed him again. They tied him up, put him on a wagon, and put him in jail. These Africans, these prosperous, intelligent Africans were put in jail overnight. And the next morning, they were put, rounded up, put on the train, and run out of town. So they were, they were, growing up in Wilmington, you had no positive black role model. Right. All you had was a bunch of um, scared people. Right. And that vibe, is still, that vibe is still in the air. I mm -hmm. felt that vibe when I was growing up. The they called me Mr. 1898 because when I went back to Wilmington, I started talking about 1898, and they kept talking about well, why. Why you keep talking about 1898? I said, well, the reason why you people are screwed up is because of 1898. They were so much. So who are you to tell us that we're screwed up? You're from here, mm -hmm. but I'm a scholar, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. And Chris picked up on it, and, and God, Chris was God's sin. Right. No. 
You understand what I mean? Chris yeah. was a godsend. When he found out the research that, that I was doing, and Chris is also Chris also has a lot of balls. He's not scared, and neither am I. You have you can't be scared. You have to put you have to put the truth out there, and let the chips fall where they may. You know this is why it can be all I talk about is reparations. People don't want to hear me say what I have to say. Uh, I think kumbaya is fine, but now it ain't for me. I'm about reparations. Reparations now, reparations tomorrow, and reparations forever. Now, Period. Just, as far as, before we get to reparations, I definitely want to talk about what you would think would be, because there's no way there's justice, but a, a fair gr agreement for reparations. But like, just to even think about the amount of people that were affected by this, as far as the descendants or even like how, because depending on where you look is how many victims or descendants or survivors there were. So uh, around what number did you find from your research as far as people who are still alive that are descendants or what was all lost during all of the massacre? Well, we found, I found uh, maybe four or five people, but the only two who had credible were credible was Manley's grandson. Okay. Also, I, I, in addition, I've interviewed him. It's on YouTube, Dr. Manley. Okay. Uh, and I um, found um, Thomas C. Miller's descendants. They live over in Raleigh. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Manley's building was destroyed. Right. So that that's evidence the right there, you know, mm -hmm. that, that his business was destroyed. And um, Thomas C. Miller's people, they have documents showing that... Um, um, what he had, you know, because he left some money, you know, when he passed. But and incidentally, his his granddaughter, his great granddaughter, who was in the movie Wilmington on Fire, she worked at a bank. So she knows she she put a a, a figure on it, uh, and she said it, it probably would be in the millions. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it 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 was kind of difficult to find the people. Okay. But uh, mm -hmm. I was I was I got lucky. <laughs> I got very <laughs> lucky. There's also a book out now that I I like to recommend by by William Doherty, Sandy Doherty, who's also in the movie. Okay. Um, who had, the book is called From Here to Equality, mm. and it's about it's a, the subtitle of something dealing with blacks getting reparations in the 21st century. Uh, Sandy Sandy has done a meticulous job. Of of showing how we how we almost got reparations before mm -hmm. and didn't quite get them and that that we deserve reparations. Um, and he's also done some work in Wilmington. He did a lot of work in Wilmington, North Carolina, because Wilmington is a classic example of of Africans who were robbed. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously robbed. Mm -hmm. And Sandy said, first of all, Obama doesn't deserve reparations because Obama's father was not a part of the transatlantic slave trade. Oh, right. Okay. There are certain Africans here in America who deserve compensation and deserve reparations. And uh, he calculated that, uh, I don't want to give away his book, but he calculated that each of us, if you can prove that your, uh, this, your ancestor was a slave, was an enslaved African, then I think he could probably he I think he uh, calculated uh, eighty four thousand mm. dollars a person. Okay. So there's been a lot of work. As a matter of fact, I'm a member of Encobra. I've been a member of Encobra for years. There have been a lot of organizations that are, that are involved in reparations and compensation. What I what I um, um what I think what in this 1898 um, mm. event should be about is compensation. It's like a person who loses their arm or loses their leg. They should be compensated for their loss. So the word I like to use more than reparations because reparations seems to be a boogeyman. Right. I like, and, and I try to, what I'm dealing with is specificity. Mm -hmm. and, and you gotta be specific. And in this specific incident, we can prove that these people sustained a loss right. and they should be compensated. We've been looking for lawyers to handle this case, and everybody seems to be scared. Yeah. We can't find lawyers to even want to want to touch this case. Wow, wow! And 
with so much that was lost because there was the newspaper press, but people lost their businesses, their homes, as well as lives were lost as well during all of this. And just thinking also of the effects, like you were saying, people are still living as ghosts there where they're kind of scared because of they, they've they heard the stories, they've heard of the boogeyman, so to speak, of what had happened to when they tried to be better in the past or move past um, the slave mentality, so to speak, as well. And I, I know that in the movie is brought up that you guys had attempted to get reparations before and it included having it, it taught in school as far as history and so much more. Can you like elaborate more? What was that about and why it didn't get passed and what, because beyond a money figure, I feel like there needs to be more since there was a press loss and media was lost that there should be recompensation that way, that there should be at least a, a film school there because I mean Wilmington is known for making films that used to be third in the nation but like um, a film school for descend I'm mean, not just for descendants but for black people there to learn that skill set and maybe be able to start their own tv station newspaper station I don't know but I'm just curious what your thoughts are as far as that goes as well well I mean I'm in the media uh Camille I, I, I worked at the public radio station down there for 10 years okay. uh we were able there's there's there are numerous books out on this. Uh, there's one book called We Have Taken a City by a gentleman named Leon Prather. He's no longer with us, but we invited him to Wilmington. Uh, I'm, I'm somewhat of a gadfly, a troublemaker, because I've always tried to put that up out in front of people all the time. I'm talking about 1898. So we brought him to, um, to Wilmington to speak a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Dr. Prather was from Mississippi, so he had this real thick Mississippi accent. So a lot of people didn't. He, he's an interesting cat, too, because he played with the Jimmy Lunkford Big Band. Oh, wow. uh, and he decided that he didn't want to starve anymore. So he decided to go back to school. And he eventually got his Ph.D. and he became uh, a historian. And he fell into this story. He was writing about something. He was researching something else, and he fell into the story. He said, wow, I got a story that nobody knows anything about. Mm -hmm. uh, so he uh, wrote this book, and I think it was his, uh, his um, dissertation. And he, he had trouble getting it published. He eventually had a stroke. But he told me something that was very interesting. And I always tell this little, little um, you know, he would tell these riddles. He'd give me these riddles all the time. He'd say, you know, Thomas, uh, you could take a black man and put him in a suit and he looked like a million dollars. He said, you know, that's why you always have these black men who are wait waiters and bellhops. He said, and he just looks good. Black people just look good in suits. He said, but you know, Thomas, you can't say the same thing about same thing about a poor white man. He said, you just can't put them. If you put them in the same suit and everything, uh, it just ain't the same. Mm -hmm. So I guess his point was, there's such an intense jealousy of Africans. I mean, it's, it's, it's intense. You know, a perfect example of it is, is in the White House. They just can't take the fact that if you give a, if you give a black man an inch, he'll take a foot. And this it's, it's, it's just what I like, to, I like to call it African excellence. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we get a chance to do something, then we, we excel every time. Now look what Chris did with this movie. <laughs> He did that for sure. Yeah, he put yeah. it together. Uh, it's like I gave him, I gave him bits and pieces here and there, and it's like throwing somebody uh, some red meat. And he took it and 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 he became a mad dog. I'm very yeah. proud of him uh, because I've been singing the same, the same thing that's in this movie. I've been singing that tune for for decades. I even had a bookstore in Wilmington mm -hmm. uh, in the African American community. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called Roots Cultural Store. And I had a, uh, I would sell my books there. I had a gentleman who walked in one day. He was from out of town. And he said, uh, man, this is a strange town. He said, what, what's, what's going on with this town? He said, I don't understand the vibe. So I said, well, you got a minute? And I told him about 1898. And he said, man, you're telling me about some shit I don't even want to know about. He turned around and walked out of the store. So people, they don't want to, they don't want to hear about this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, um, it, but it's a story that will not go away because mm -hmm. it was a tragedy. You know, it was, it was uh, a tragedy of 
a large proportion. I mean, once you start studying this thing, and if you Google it, you will find out that there's been, like I said before, this thing is well documented. Mm -hmm. But it was supposed to be a secret, and the secret is there is no secret. Right. That's the secret. You know, I was so happy that Chris came along. It's been it's been a wonderful experience, and it's still happening. I'm still having I'm I'm having a ball, <laughs> having a good time. And you're finally getting heard, and your um, story is getting shared in such a way. I'm yeah. curious what you think would be, because again, I, I want to hear what you think would be, um, not necessarily justice, but just what you would hope to see come out of this as far as, I mean, it's great. Everybody's talking about it. And this is one of those times since there's kind of a pause button because of the pandemic, people are doing their research, they're learning more, they're right. open to it. So it's a great time to kind of say, what would you like to see happen? What can we hold our um, government officials accountable for as far as moving forward? Because, I mean, it is an election year <laughs> for a lot of these senators and um just recently, even with UNC Wilmington, where they were able to get rid of Mike Adams, who was a known, um, I won't even go into all the list of things he did. I, don't even, I hate I even said his name to give him any more press, but right. he's getting ready to be no longer teaching at UNC Wilmington starting his August 1st. So, and even with the statue coming down, the Confederate statue, just as of recently, now yeah, is a great wonderful. time to kind of say, this is what we demand. This is what we right. deserve. Right. What, what would you like for that to be? Oh, it's, I'm having a ball. I lo I'm loving every minute of it. I, I think um, uh, I can't be out there doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, I, you know, um, Dick Gregory says there's a new generation of, of children, people coming forth. They're called the indigo children. Mm -hmm. And these are different people. Uh, you know, what happens is the people who are, are doing these things now, who are re there's a rebellion going on. Mm -hmm. The people who are doing these things now went to school with, other folks who didn't look like them. And they realized that, oh, this is, is a bunch of crap. You know, they realized that, that you know, that, that the uh, African is just as able to do things just as well as they can. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, I'm having a ball. I think it's a wonderful thing that's happening now. Never in a million years would, would I have ever thought that I would see the day that this would happen. Mm -hmm. It's just a wonderful experience for me. Um, well, you know, uh, what I want to see out of this whole thing, like I said, I'm not really into this kumbaya thing. I was really, when I was a child of the 60s, I never really marched. I mean, I'm not, I wasn't into that. My hero was Malcolm X and Kwame Ture and Rap Brown. I think I marched one time. And I saw this Caucasian in the pool who spit on a brother in front of me. And I said, well, I'm not, a, I'm not for this marching. You can mm -hmm. march till you're blue, right. till your feet are blue. But, you know, my aim is compensation. Period. That's why I'm a reparationist. You know, that's what I would like to see happen. Okay. I would like to see a high-powered lawyer come forward and take this case over because I was talking to Dr. John Ho Franklin uh, mm -hmm. once, and John Ho Franklin said um, what the whites did at that particular time, they just couldn't take it. And his quote was, they had to cut them down to size. And of course, John Hope knows all about that because his father was um, was a was was a victim of the Tulsa massacre. John Hope Franklin was from was, was from Oklahoma. Right, right. I have his book from Freedom to Slavery, and yes. I actually was looking through it to try to find more information to ask you questions because I'm kind of a history nerd, and yes. I couldn't find anything in there about Wilmington. It's in there. That. It's a small paragraph. It's okay. in there. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. It was just like a couple of lines I saw that it was more or less like saying it. Um, there was a race riot. I want to say it wasn't necessarily mentioned as a massacre, but I'll have to double check because I read a lot of different. Well, yeah, you have to understand when he when he published it and when he wrote it, he had to call it a race oh, riot. OK. Yeah. We were the ones. Chris and I were the ones who changed that title from mm -hmm. a race massacre oh, to race riot. a coup d'etat. Okay. All before we started doing what we started to do. It was called a race ride. It was not a race ride. A race ride is something that's spontaneous. This was planned mm -hmm. by a group of cowards who decided that they wanted to displace the existing government. And they basically, they wanted to, quote unquote, put the niggas in their place. Mm -hmm. This is a constant theme. Mm -hmm. You know, they just can't take the fact that the African can do what he could do. You give the African an inch, he'll take a foot. 
We do it every time. They do it every time. That's that's their theme. That's their theme song. You have to understand that the U- the Europeans who do that, the white Anglo Saxon Protestants who do that, are a small, small part of the population. You understand? And they whip these other people into a frenzy. They promise them jobs. They promise them this and promise them that. And in the end, the people who um, agitated these poor whites and these not so poor whites into doing what they did, they ended up not giving them anything. So they got shafted. Mm-hmm. You know, you know. But my thing is is rep- reparations, uh, Camille. That's all I'm about. See, I'm because I'm a history buff. I wanted to be in the school books too, just because if we don't learn about this in a way where people don't start noticing when yeah. propaganda is happening again, whether it's fake news or um, immigrants or all the different things that they we're just going to keep reliving this cycle. And right. I just don't want to keep seeing this happen because we could be. Uh, yes. A country that does come together, that works together, and I, like you were mentioning earlier about a, um, black people having you give us an inch, we take a mile, is because we've been all taught from an early age that we have to be twice as good right. to even be recognized, and that's a lot of pressure on, and just not being yeah. able to really figure out when we can really win. You know, like it's always yes. just thinking, even for. My father, who's the same around the same age as you, he worked as a freedom writer and he came down to the South to help with voting. And he yes. noticed when he was arrested and was put in jail for a few months where he was beaten by police there as well. And it got him to thinking how important and how big of an impact media had, because for so many people who couldn't read, they would hand out these comic books to show them how to vote, how to get past yes. all the different things that they would prevent us from yes. voting. And I noticed that same pattern in Wilmington on Fire about how they were using comics for those that weren't smart enough to read to yes. demonize the black man. And so I just want to make sure that if we don't start noticing those patterns and start really educate our youth so they don't fall into that same trap where they're generalizing people based on race or whether they're immigrants or whatever it may be, blue eyes, blonde, um, blonde hair, whatever it could be that we're just going to keep having the same every 30 years or less issue. And I just, I just, that's why I was asking what more could we do besides reparation? Cause I totally agree that they should definitely be compensated for their loss. And, uh, but to move beyond that, to make sure it doesn't happen again with each generation that we, um, that the, uh, well, maybe a well, kid friendlier version of this is this is required. <laughs> well, I understand. Yeah, is- right. Well, I understand your point, but like I said before, this mm-hmm. incident is well documented. Mm-hmm. It's well documented. You, it, it, if you're looking for some information on it, you can find it. Right. You understand? So but it's that's, not in the history books that kids are learning in school. You know, and that's not required. Well, yeah, you know, you know? it's not going. That's not going to. Ha- well, that's not going to happen until you make it happen. You know, and I, as a historian, there are three. Uh, incidentally, when I was in grad school researching, researching the um, the Wilmington Ten and the 1898 massacre, there were two people there. One one girl was doing her thesis on the the Wilmington incident in 1898. She was from Japan, mm. and there was another gentleman there. He was from Germany doing research. So everybody knows about this thing, you know. And, and actually. My advisor said, I want you to meet this gentleman. And, and the guy said, you're from Wilmington? And he, he kept looking me up and down as just to say, you survived. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so my, I guess my point is, mm-hmm. it's well documented. Okay. It's not that there's not any information out there about it. I think what Chris did was enhance the, the, the interest mm-hmm. because I think more, more, more people would like to see a movie than to read a book. But um, it's 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 a constant struggle, a luta continua. It's a constant struggle, and you have to stick at it. You just can't, you know. You just have to keep putting it out there, putting it out there. And in terms of being, in terms of being, what this whole incident was about, what the the coup d'état and the massacre. When you're sitting around in in seminars in grad school, when I we would sit around and you you zero in on on a particular subject, the 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 historical importance, the historical significance of this thing that happened in 1898 is that it ushered in the white supremacist movement of the 20th 20th century. That's the historical significance. Mm -hmm. 
Now, just to kind of move forward with Wilmington on Fire Two, what can we can you what can we expect for that, or um, to be for us to learn from that more about reparations? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's what we're going to talk about, according to Chris. Now, I'm not a movie. I'm not. I'm not a movie maker. Right. Right. You know, uh, I'm a, I'm what they call a quote unquote talent. <laughs> and so I just what found out. Uh, okay, huh? No, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, and I just found out that I was was an actor. I, I didn't know that either. I, 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 you know, I keep some people keep labeling me as an actor. I didn't, that's news to me. Oh yeah, just, I don't know if you were acting in that film, but um, it's right. I, I, don't I know, agree. Yeah. So I, I had to close out the other screens. So I don't know how much longer we have to make sure um, that we're not cut off. But I just wanted to see if there was more that you wanted to share to make sure people knew and. Um, if there was any questions as well from the audience, so I'm just going to kind of open that back up. When I closed the other screen, I wasn't hearing echoing anymore, so I closed it out. Uh huh. Yeah. Just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Is there a question for somebody? Else? Well, I guess we'll find out soon. I see something here in, in terms of uh, what happened to their homes. Mm. I read that Manley came back to Wilmington years later and found a record of his property. It happened to others too. Yeah, of course. Sure. Um, a lot of them didn't come back. We were scared to come back. Yeah. I mean, they were running out of town. It took a lot to ever come back. Mm -hmm. And another thing that happened when the, the people that they killed, they left, them, they left it in the street. They left the bodies in the streets. So the, the stench is still in the air. Sometimes on a on a dreary November day, uh, you could actually hear those people screaming. I can. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's a vibe in the air that's funky in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. It was cold-blooded robbery, and they got away with it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cold-blooded robbery. Yeah. So, um, I'm just checking the questions, because it goes back pretty far. Um, what progress has been made in compensating African descendants of the Wilmington uh, massacre is asked by Tanya Miller. Zero. Okay. Nothing. Okay. We can't get a lawyer to take, take the case. They're scared. Now, with DNA tests, could, um, could those be used to find people? Some may not even know that they're related to or descendants of the Wilmington on fire from Shanty. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I thought you were about to say more. Um, Nicole Gilliam, she also heard the idea of never having to pay taxes again and free university education. Uh, yeah, that was Dr. Umar. Okay. Oh. Dr. Umar said that uh, in the film. Yeah. Those are all great ideas and, you know, all... You know, the per perfect uh, dream ending. Mm -hmm. You know, if we want to make a dream ending, we could we could make it a you know a dream. But um, it's gonna take a lot of hard work. Uh, I see these people walking around with all these signs, these thousands of people walking down the street, and they those signs are saying, uh, uh, "What is it? I can't breathe," or mm -hmm. uh, "Black Lives Matter." I'd like to see a day when people are, have mass a mass movement for reparations. People walking around down the street saying reparations, compensation. Yeah. I'm looking forward for that day. Uh, thank you all, because our descendants, they built this, like there was a video going around where, um, I think her name's Kimberly Jones, where she mentions we built this country for free. <laughs> so um, definitely deserve to be rep um, paid for it. And um, someone has mentioned, I watched the Watchmen TV series, which is based on the Tulsa event. Do these fraction series help as well, do you think? Of course. Oh, most definitely. You know, the more the merrier. The more we hear about these things, the better. Because um, I, I recall watching a 60 Minutes program. It was on Rosewood. And they were talking to this African-American lady who was a young girl when she was run out of town. And the, the, I think the closing statement was, I think they asked her, oh, what is what is your closing thought? She said, never let them surround you. Mm. Huh. And that, that blew my mind. Yeah. Um, 
So oh. James Devereaux asking, it's frustrating to know that there wasn't any justice that had for that was done to the African people who were killed, the businesses burned down and being forced to leave. Imagine something like that happening with this today's technology. No justice. Will there ever be peace? Is that a question? I don't feel like it is. I think it was more of a statement. To <laughs> the end, but um, I mean, uh, I, if again, like if we don't right the wrongs of our ancestors, we're doomed to repeat it, especially if we don't learn the lessons from it. We also have to respect our ancestors and, and what they did to, to lay the foundation for, for what we where we are today. If you don't have any respect for your ancestors, then, then you really um, you should be ashamed of yourself. You know, I, 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 um, I respect what my ancestors did. I, what I like, I like to use Wilmington, what happened in Wilmington as a, as a role model right. as to what we could do. Right. You know, if we look at, if we look at what these people, I mean, like I keep making this point, this is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. These, uh, Thomas C. Miller was a slave. He was a full-blooded African. He 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 was not deluded at all. Deluded at all. He was, you know, he was. I mean, he was able to do what he did. It was no short of a nothing short of a miracle. You know, he was a businessman, a prosperous African businessman in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we can do that. Mm -hmm. But we have to be aware of the fact that they're not going to get you. We're not going to let you get too high. <laughs> You're not gonna get too high. They don't like that. No, you're not gonna get too high unless you be willing to bought, be willing to be a bought, bought off and become a non-threatening Negro. They like those kind of guys. Yeah. Um, so Catherine is asking, where can we buy Larry's book on the Wilmington Ten? She's having trouble finding a copy. Really? Um, you know yeah. they're selling my book on on no. online. Amazon is selling my book for nine hundred and two dollars. Yeah. There's a lady on eBay who's actually trying to sell my my book with my autograph. She's trying to sell that for like seventy bucks. Okay. Wow. Um, the true story behind the Wilmington Ten. I have a a closet box full of them. A box full of them in my closet. They can reach out to me at my my, my oh, email. Okay. Oh, my bookstore. My bookstore lasted in Wilmington for about almost two years. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not functioning anymore. That's really one of the things that Wilmington needs is is a black as a bookstore. But they can email me at L R T zero three nine three at hotmail dot com. Somebody told me that's old man, you got an old you old email address. Hey, if it still works, it doesn't yeah, matter. Right. L R T zero three nine three at hotmail dot com. And I'll send them an autograph copy. Not for nine hundred and two bucks though. <laughs> because everybody's saying that it's out of print. It is not out of print. And incidentally, I had to go to a black publisher. Mm. I couldn't go to uh, uh, the other pub. They don't want to hear. They don't want to hear anything from the African American perspective, especially when it deals when it's raw. Mm -hmm. You think what I'm saying? They don't want. They don't want to hear that. They, mm, they, they just. They just. They, like I, like John Franklin said, they, they want to cut you down to size. And one of the things that's really hurting these people now is the fact that Obama went to the White House. That's they're like, they're like foaming at the mouth. Mm -hmm. That it was actually an African American in the White House and became president. That 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 they won't ever get over that. They won't ever get and to to, to see what's happening now with all these demonstrations and what's going on, all these Confederate uh, statues coming down. It's just. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That's the only way I can describe it. It's wonderful. It's in, you know? It was intimidating. I mean, I still think yes. that they need to work on the Confederate flags that are up on right. the highways in 95. Um, right. And even with like different public events, because I know NASCAR is no longer allowing it there, but what about the state fairs here? Or because um, that's one of the reasons my family, we won't attend because it's intimidating. You don't feel comfortable. You don't feel welcomed. And um, right. as long as those very, like I grew up a military brat. So I grew up in Germany where Nazi flags were illegal and the right. whole concept of coming here to America and finding out it's like everywhere. 
And I right. think even seeing that Mississippi is taking it out of the flag is, is yes. a sign that it's we're Wonderful. going in the right direction and we just need to keep asking for what we want so we can make it happen. Now I want to make think, sure uh, that you, okay, oh, sorry. I think we're on our way. I, I, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. <laughs> That's my favorite word. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, I remember making, they were making sure the email address they heard was correctly. Oh, that's fantastic. He's back. Uh-oh, there's an echo. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. I had to close out all my settings on the screen there so it wouldn't echo. But, um, yeah, he's in yeah, Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Thank Larry. you Camille, Thank you, Larry. for this fascinating conversation. I mean, there's just so much you elaborated on and further on about Wilmington that, you know, we can talk forever, um, but don't have forever, but do have other opportunities to expand the knowledge on it. So, Thank you again. Thank you, uh, thank you Camille, for the wonderful questions and for hosting. Uh, this has been fantastic. Um, um, so thank you, audience. Thank you all for your patience. Um, thank you for being a central part of why we do this. And your support is how we continue to make this happen. So if you haven't watched the film yet, if you haven't watched Women's in a Fire yet, please make sure to buy your ticket and watch it by this Thursday, July 2nd. Um, go right to blackbox.com. Um, you're on the Facebook page most likely now. If you're not, um, there's numerous links to the songs there. But it's simple. DLKDocs.com. And you can watch the film, like I said, until this Thursday, June 2nd. 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 Sorry, I'm all over the place. Sorry. Um, but thank you again. Thank you for being here with us. And um, watch the film. Check out everything that Larry is working on. Check out the Neil show. And thank you again for joining us. Have a very good night. Have a good day. Okay, thank you so much. Camille, it was so nice talking to you. You're the greatest. Oh, it's my pleasure, Larry. Anytime. Okay, bye-bye.